when you're ready. So hi, everyone. Uh, today, we have a special guest for our Tuzo talk on Wednesday this week. We have Alejandro Montero, and Hello. he is going to present some of his uh, research and just talk about uh, different things. So I'll let him share a screen and start. Well, I don't have any research. I'll let you. I'm not some kind of grad student, but uh, yeah, okay. I will uh, share definitely in my experience uh, as a UTM Earth Science graduate and as a uh, uh, registered geoscientist in training. So I'm going to share my screen so you all can see my presentation. Right. Can everyone see it? Yep, it's good. All right, so let's uh, start. Wait, hold on. It's down here. All right, I move my Zoom thing. All right, so essentially this, this talk will be a brief talk on how to overcome the many obstacles that exist in becoming a certified GIT, as well as all the other things I wish I knew when I was in my undergrad journey at UTM. So who am I? Uh, my name is Alejandro. I started uh, UTM Earth Science in the year 2014, and I didn't graduate until 2019. And a lot of it was because I made a point to get as many of the course requirements that the PGO, APGO at the time, required earth science graduates to have to become certified geoscientists in training. Uh, the journey was a lot more confusing and chock full of obstacles that I didn't really know existed. So the goal here is for me to sort of guide some of you guys, especially at first, second and third year students that still have a lot of time uh, to uh, not struggle the same way that I did when I started. So another thing is that I was among the first group of students alongside uh, three other people, I think, Mahalo, Eliza, and Colin, that uh, were the first ever UTM students to fulfill their APGO requirements and get the earth rings and become GITs upon graduation. I was also like uh, Alessio and I think Juliana over here. I was a former JT, J2 Zo Wilson Geology Club executive member. I was that for two years in a row. So I will also be talking about how to get involved in uh, the geoscience community and how to do the best of uh, making your time an undergraduate pleasurable experience. So PGO course requirements at UTM, uh, of course, as some of you may have, you've seen it go to PDAC or have gone to the Tuzo Wilson meeting about PGO, there's an extensive list about, um, I think there's a lot of uh, requirements uh, specifically designed for first year and second year, then they just get more and more vague as time goes on and you have more options. This is good in that you're very open to take whatever courses you want, but it's a problem in that it gets more and more vague and uh, the requirements don't exactly make a good effort in uh, explaining you what you need to do and what you have to take in order to fulfill your EUs, what they call them there. So until recently, it was actually impossible to fulfill all of your requirements at UTM, but Thanks to the hard work of a lot of UTM Earth Science faculty, uh, a lot of these gaps have been filled, whether it was with the additions of new faculty or new courses that the same faculty are teaching. So there is not as many obstacles for you guys, thankfully, as there was for me when I started this program. So uh, with that note, we're gonna talk about some things that I wish I knew because to be fair, I did have more obstacles because UTM wasn't the same as it is back that it is now, but uh, I did still make a lot of mistakes. So uh, a big part of this, this talk is gonna be how to not make the same mistakes I made and graduate in a timely manner with all your requirements. So first thing you need to do about the folks over at PGO is that they're, they're not very familiar with us. Um, whenever they see an application from someone from U of T, they just assume you went to St. George and they are very familiar with the courses that they take over there and the professors and every, because a lot of the professors there are also certified professional geoscientists. So they are very familiar with their program, not at all familiar with our program. So a lot of the time you will be uh, submitting a lot of courses that they will not be familiar with and they're very likely to overlook them. There are a few ways that you can get around this or you can get them to notice them. So when, when a registrar is doing an assessment to determine which course is valid, they will, the first thing that they will look at is the name of the course. And if the name of the course matches with that name that's listed on the EU page for PGO, they will almost certainly not even look at the rest of the information. 
Now, UTM until recently did offer a lot of courses that would be valid for PGO, but weren't titled in such a way. For example, Lindsay's Structural Geology uh, wasn't called that until recently, for example, or Mineralogy and Petrology were called different things. So you, what, what you would end up doing is submitting that as a course requirement. It would get rejected. And then you had to have an email conversation with one of the registrars showing proof, uh, sort of like a syllabus or assignments that you did to prove that you did do the course content required to, for it to count as a requirement. Uh, this is, of course, very tedious and very time consuming. And thanks to the hard work over by the faculty, this is no longer an issue. And a lot of courses have changed their names to match with it. But there, I'm sure that if you go into other departments like geography or biology or chemistry that you might want to use as course requirements, they are not familiar with this at all. And you still might have to do some uh, syllabus fishing in order for that to work. I will go over the process of uh, essentially submitting an assessment before applying, which is that's a very effective way of making sure that your application doesn't get rejected. So uh, moving on, here's an outline of what to expect. So the first thing that they want you to do is to graduate. As long as you graduate with some kind of earth science a major slash specialist, they're, they're going to be very lenient in letting you in, even if you don't quite meet all the requirements. This is very important. So the first thing that I recommend you do when you are ready to graduate or when you know that you will be fulfilling all your requirements is to write an email to either one of the two registrars at PGO. AFTEV is the main registrar, but I don't recommend him because, well, he's extremely helpful and extremely nice. He's also very busy and it takes him a while to get back to you. Oftentimes it can take two to three months. So uh, I recommend emailing the other registrar. I believe it's Lady, but I don't remember her name. I did meet her at PDEC though. She's very nice. So what, what I recommend that you do is that uh, get all the courses that you have taken and all the courses that you are planning to take and know will take find the syllabi for these courses and attach them into the email as PDFs and list them out and say for what requirement you think that course will go for. And once you have that set up, send it to them and they will essentially go down the list and check it for you. This is the most effective way of doing it so that you don't get rejected when you just send them a transcript and they look at your transcript, only look at the course names, don't really make any more research into it and then just overlook a lot of things that actually do count for a use. That happened to me. I went back and forth with them for about two months until they accepted all of my course requirements. And I was at UTM for five years. So uh, let's just say that they don't like to do a very thorough job if you don't make them. So once they have looked at your uh, courses, you can begin your formal application. Your formal application consists of going on the PGO website and click on the register thing. By the way, there is a fee for applying. Uh, your registration fee is actually waived. Uh, for your first time, but it's not for a, it's like an application fee for a university. So they don't tell you this. It's actually quite expensive. It's like $200. And after that, you had to send them an official transcript. Now, if you're, for some reason, your graduation date is in November as opposed to uh, April or June, uh, you're going to have to both send them a transcript. And then once you get your degree, you're going to have to send them a scanned copy of that. That is because uh, your transcript, when you get it at the end of August, it's going to have all of your courses in it. It's going to have all your grades in it, but it's not going to have that you graduated on it. It's not going to be checked. So they also need proof of graduation. And the only way you can do this after your transcript is finalized is by sending them a copy of your degree. I didn't do this. So when I applied in October, they never got back to me and I had to get back to them in like January. And they said to me, oh, we don't have proof that you graduated. And I was like, what do you mean? My transcript is complete. I graduated in November they made me send them a copy of my degree. So yeah, make sure that you do that if your graduation date is in November and not for June. So, oh, and that's another thing that you need to watch out for them. They don't check with you. They will not email you asking you for something if you forgot it in your application. They just expect you to have everything on hand. So that's why I'm making this list uh, with detailed steps so that you're not missing anything when it comes time for you to apply. Because like I said, I forgot to send them a copy of my degree in October and they didn't, they just didn't get back to me. They didn't tell me, hey, your degree's missing. They didn't care. I had to get back to them. So don't make the mistakes that I made. Now, here's a few other obstacles that I faced. Uh, there is a lot of courses that are cross-departmental. So for example, there is a lot of environmental science courses that are under the umbrella of uh, geography over at UCN. Those courses are great. A lot of them will count for your uh, EUs. 
for the TGO, but the problem with them is that they make conflict with a lot of courses that are offered in the earth science department. And there is a, not a lot of interdepartment uh, conversations happening at UTM. And this has been the case for many years. I'm not sure if it's changed recently. I hope that it has. So it'll make you guys life easier, but so far it hasn't, at least not when I graduated. And of course, having this a, causes a lot of conflicts to happen so that let's say you need to take ecology for a biology credit, but it conflicts with, uh, I don't know, sedimentology. You can't take two courses at the same time. That basically pushes you forward to another year, essentially, of having to take an entire year for one course, which is absolutely horrible. I had to do that. I did a fifth. I could have graduated in four years. I had to do five because of a lot of conflicts like this. This also happens if you're planning to take courses in the St. George campus. Uh, they don't talk to UTM about specific courses that may or may not be conflicting. So if this happens, uh, you, you got to keep that in mind when you're making your schedule. Um, let's see. Uh, there are combinations that are actually not valid because uh, APGO considers them to be the same course. Uh, and then there's a lot of bizarre combinations that actually do count, even though you think they are the same course. To give you an example, I took conservation biology and ecology. You would think they're the same course and that they wouldn't count for separate EUs. Turns out they do. But then there's other bizarre examples, like if you take like higher level linear algebra and you already took higher level statistics, they might, uh, they might contest you on that, but like I said, so long as you show them the receipts, the syllabi, you should be clean. And now, like I mentioned on the previous slide, having to use the syllabus is, is probably the best way to argue for any specific courses that you think deserve an EU that they are overlooking. I can't stress this enough. Always keep your receipts. Now, uh, moving on from APGO, things about the environmental science industry that I, I have been dab dabbling on a little bit since I started my, uh, my postgraduate certification in environmental technician work. I have had some experience as opposed to a lot of professionals in this area. So first, if you wanna be introduced to a lot of professionals in either the mining or geology sector or the environmental science sector, you gotta do a lot of networking. And if you're environmental, I'm sorry, majoring in anything environmental science related or earth science related, this is what you wanna do. If you like to be out in the field, if you like to be doing uh, work using machinery or uh, looking at rocks or cores or taking uh, different monitoring wells, things like that, you are basically out of luck if you don't know how to operate a motor vehicle. I'm serious. If you don't have your driver's license yet for whatever reason, uh, do the best you can to get one as soon as possible, as quickly as possible. I know in a pandemic it's difficult to find uh, road tests, but if you don't get it by the time you graduate, I guarantee you, you're not gonna be getting an office job where you don't need it. You will be uh, required to drive yourself to the middle of nowhere and to do uh, perform a lot of tasks in a remote field sites. And you can't do this if you don't have your own vehicle. Most companies aren't willing to just provide you with one anyway. So always be sure to keep that in mind. Industry experience is probably the best acquired and you can ask Christian and Alessio about this if you get them while you're in your third and fourth year because if you never do anything like this and then you graduate you're not going to be in for a good time if uh, you're trying to get into the market without any kind of experience at a company in the same uh, industry so i recommend that you start looking around second or third year so that gives you like one or two years of air of you know not finding anything so that you can by the time you graduate have at least you know one summer working some on something and if you're not very keen about the industry for whatever reason you can do other things. You can do a research with a lot of professors. I know Lindsay and Jochen are very open to taking undergraduate students. Uh, Marx takes a lot of RP students as well. So those are very good options. So just do anything you can to get some kind of relevant experience in the uh, industry. Obviously, industry experience is more relevant to companies than it is academic experience. But everything, everything counts and everything is something that I would recommend doing while you're still in your undergraduate and not after. Obviously get involved in the, the J2s of Wilson Club. The J2s of Wilson Club was not just, it didn't, it didn't just give me a lot of good experiences in terms of my involvement with the community at UTM, but it was also very good for a career building perspective. You gain a lot of leadership skills. You get to, um, a lot of good decision-making and cooperation with your peers. So if you are into that kind of stuff, I highly recommend getting involved with them. You don't even have to be an exec. You just gotta, you know, help out every now and then, go to their events. Have people here that are in this meeting, you know, you guys are a good example, but there's people that are gonna be watching this. If you like 
earth science, if you like the community UTM, definitely get involved with that club. So uh, and there's other ways of getting involved and getting uh, some kinds of tangible experience that is not necessarily paid. Um, to give you an example, uh, I volunteered for about five years at the Royal Ontario Museum in the Biodiversity Gallery, and I made a lot of industry connections there and a lot of people that are very passionate about the same issues as I am. I have done a lot of nature stewardship for uh, conservation authorities, and I recently started working uh, as a uh, invasive plant removal person at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Burlington. And I know there's a lot of places, especially in Mississauga, that do take volunteers for these things. Obviously, we are in the midst of a global pandemic, and there's not a lot of people that are going to be looking, going out of their way to look for volunteers. I know that Rom's not taking anyone. But when things get better, I do recommend looking at places like this to get some experience. They love taking students. And a lot of times, if you email a lot of people, they will very kindly offer you some kind of volunteer work. I know uh, one of the people that graduated with me, uh, Kale, he straight up cold emailed one of the curators of paleontology at the ROM. And he was there once a week cleaning up dinosaur fossils. You know, so you like dinosaurs, you want to clean up real dinosaur fossils, go email someone at the ROM. You, you got to... You got to do the best you can to get involved in the things that you like. And that's probably what's going to push you and give you an advantage over people that never did anything and just got their degree. So thank you for watching. Uh, if you guys need any help uh, with PGO requirements or want an unofficial assessment by a definitely not certified registrar, I being me, just feel free to reach out to me. That's my email right there. My YouTube email still works. I don't know how. Uh, and if you guys have any more questions, just feel free to ask. I'll be here all night. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, no worries. Let me unshare my screen. I don't know how to do this. Oh, stop sharing. Uh, that cool. was really good. That was really good. I actually really like that. Thanks, buddy. Uh, no, just like when you're talking about um, like putting yourself out there, like there's people who don't don't try, you know, like they don't bother. They don't they think trade up don't, right? And you work with uh, with Kim Tate with the meteorites, right? Yeah, like I'm I'm done my project with her, but like yeah, they do just they do discussion groups every week, and I actually emailed her today, like, hey, like, can you pop me in? Because like, and they're like, yeah, like of course, because I asked, right? So it all just starts from asking. Oh wait, hold on. There's some there's some questions here on the on the group chat. Let me see if I can answer to them. Where's all right. That? Oh, the bra. How would you? Uh, the second point, uh, how would that work in the current pandemic? I think he's talking so, about industry experience on that point. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. There, there are places that are hiring for, for the industry. Uh, it's going to be more difficult, but uh, for example, uh, Alessio, you took that course that offers an internship, right? And you're Correct. currently CPS working 400. And you're currently working at CVC. So that's one of the different ways that you can find uh, ways to get into that industry. I know Oryx takes people. Uh, but, and it is one of the few things that we have a little bit of a privilege over people that have traditional office corporate jobs is that field work has different standards of safety in regards of COVID. If you're out in the open, uh, chances are you're not gonna be at a higher risk of getting con you know, uh, any kind of uh, transmission out there. So, a lot of these companies are taking the risk to start hiring people and start taking interns and studentships and students for the summer. So uh, you will see more postings from companies like that than you will for corporate positions in like banks or something. But you're right. Uh, there is not as much of a surge in uh, hiring right now because of the pandemic. So that will be definitely a challenge. But unless you are in your fourth or fifth year, you still have a few years ahead of you to find something. Like I said, you don't have to get a job every summer and if you can't try to get some kind of research position or some kind of rop or try to do something you don't have to have to get a you just got to get your head your mindset into working in the industry and not just getting through school 100 percent of the time right yeah, you're yeah i think that was a a huge point that you mentioned i have here um one of the best things i think you talked about was don't wait for the opportunities to come reach out and really um, make those opportunities happen. Email a professor, go for a volunteer position, just do something because once something's posted, hundreds of people are going to try 
getting on exactly. that. So and, I think and, it's... And that's what makes you stand out, that you went out of your way to do something that you're interested in. I'm very passionate about conservation and biodiversity. I have been volunteering at the ROM for half a decade. That, that looks good when you're applying to things. Let's say you are a really big fan of space. Well, look at that. If you were literally doing research on meteorites because you ask, not because someone asked you, that looks very good. So it's, yes, you also have to go out of your way to find these things, but always try to go for something that you know that you're passionate about, because then you can talk very passionately about it and that looks good and it gives you a lot of good skills uh, to work on when you're say interviewing for a position. So uh, definitely something that you guys should probably start putting, thinking about right now, especially if you're in the early years. Yeah. I think you also mentioned that a lot of the profs at UTM offer ROPs, thesis projects, just yeah. even volunteering in a lab. And it's that first experience and that first job that really sets you apart. And that's the hardest to get. But once you get that, yeah. you're literally golden. Oh, and uh, uh, specifically for first year earth science, once you're in your fourth, fifth year, make sure that you apply to TA that course. There's a lot of positions and usually not enough grad students to fill up all of them. So that's also a very good one if you want to get a job in the in the department. That's one of the easier ones to, to get for sure. Yeah. Um, could you just briefly touch upon, so the viewers know, um, why volunteering is so important versus getting like an actual paid job? Can you talk about the benefits of both. Because volunteering shows that you're passionate about something, right? Well, obviously working in the industry for a paid job shows that you are a professional and serious about the work that you do. A lot of companies value people that have a passion for what they're doing and that they're not just showing up to work for a paycheck, but showing up to work because they want to do what they're doing and rather not be doing anything else. So I think that's probably the main point that you should take away from that. Like, as long as you're doing something relevant to the industry, you're in a good spot. Uh, okay, that's yes. I was gonna answer that question, but got it already. And yes, uh, uh, one more thing is that uh, I know that Lindsay and Mark and Jochen have all worked very hard to come up with a lot of new courses at UTM that I'm not familiar with, but I can still do my best to help you guys if you send me your, your assessments and <laughs> I'll do whatever I can to tell you what uh, valid for EUs and what isn't. Although I'm sure that you guys are in a much better position than I was two years ago. So, you know. Well, how do you think that your experience at the ROM and the botanical gardens there, and even like your schoolwork has helped you get to where you are now? Do you value that? Of course. I wish I could still be doing it, but uh, the pandemic has the ROM shut down. Otherwise, I would still be going every week. And yeah, because it uh, it allows me to do something other than, uh, you know, just academic work, which is what I'm doing right now, just doing school. But uh, when you can take a break and go do something that you're passionate about, and that is also relevant to gaining experience in an industry you want to be a part of, that is very fulfilling. And so even if I'm just literally just going through the same thing and teaching the same things to kids over and over every week, it doesn't get old because I love it. So I guess that's the, probably the main thing you should take away from you. You gotta do something that you love. Don't just apply for a volunteer position at something that you just absolutely can't stand. You're in for a bad time if you do that. Yeah. Um, if anyone has any more questions, uh, we can stay a few more minutes, but post them in the chat. I think in the next upcoming weeks, we have, it's gonna be a lot easier to uh, meet some other professors. We have Lindsay coming on. We have Samaka coming on. Um, we have Phoebe coming on. She's Jokin's postdoc that can talk about those experiences. And I think that'll be really beneficial and help our new students really see the professional side and what is offered at UTM rather than just seeing it on paper. Yeah. Wait, so Alejandro, what are you what are you up to now? Huh? I am getting a diploma in environmental technician. And I am also uh, working at the RBG. 
So uh, that's what I'm doing at the moment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry. I just figured to ask anyways again. <laughs> yeah. No worries, man. It's yeah, I actually, I actually talked to um, Mahilo Saint Alessia the other day. Mahilo and see like how he's doing, and it's just like, it's like a lot of the same stuff you just went over. So it's yeah, interesting. I mean, Mahilo, he he's actually swamped with a lot of work, eh? Yeah, 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 yeah. So like I said before, yeah, we're in a pandemic, but field work is field work, man. So yeah. Field work needs to be done, so don't don't you always at least look for opportunity. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone else has any more questions. Um, so I'd like to, from everyone at the club, thank you for coming on. We also appreciate the years that you put in to help the club to where it is today. So thank you for that. Oh, no problem. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. So we'll also be posting this lecture. So if you missed his email, it will be on the recording. And yeah, yeah thank you again for coming.